This is the discourse with Dr. Ken. Today on the discourse, our topic for discussion is the monster called drug abuse. So today we are going to discuss drug abuse. Like I, you, you would have um, gotten that. Um, like I told you, it's such a topic that is not only touchy, but it's a topic that affects us all, and it's worth discussing. And um, no other than Dr. Biodio uh, Oshiemi. Um, Dr. Biodio Oshiemi. Um, of course, I was looking for who who is that expert that will you know really really do justice to this topic and. Um, I uh, had a long conversation with him during the week, and I said, you know what, you are, I think you are the best resource, the best, um, not just because you're a doctor, but he but but has that broad cerebral bandwidth um, to be able to deal with the topic of this size. So, le- as usual with the discourse, let me take uh, his profile. Dr. Biodo Shiemi is the founder medical director of Oxford Health Consultants Lagos. He is a medical doctor and specialist microbiologist with the Medical and Dental Council, Nigeria. Dr. Biodo Shiemi is a forensic investigator and a member of Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences, UK, and President Association of Forensic Sciences and Expert Witness Niger- in Nigeria. Dr. Shiemi is a highly sought-after consultant on performance, stress management, drug abuse, and relationship challenges. Doctor, how are you today? Well, I thank you. And nice to be here again. <laughs> uh, happy Sunday. When I, I told you that I'm going to call it a monster, you said, yes, that is the most appropriate. Thing. So why do you consider drug abuse a monster? All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Ken. And um, I want to thank um, Classic FM for doing this kind of um, enlightenment. A monster is something of horror, something that causes severe injury and death. Um, so, in this case, it doesn't have to be a living being, but an entity. So, we'll look at drug abuse as this entity that um, all over the world, um, many people go into it. In Nigeria, you can imagine we have about um, 14.3 million from NDLA stats uh, involved in this ages uh, 15 to 64 years mainly mm. and you have about one in four women in it and it's growing so it one, means one in four women one, one in four women in the ecosystem of the uh, 14.3 uh, million and it's growing so the rate of progression of women in this is so it's now a monster where caregivers train a woman train a nation uh, the people now being um, brought into it. So you can then see the disaster before us. And also globally, one point, the, the 1.1 to 1.6 billion per day is the market size. So we are saying 400 to 600 billion dollars is earned per day in this system. So which other um, economic entity can beat this monster? Mm. So I'm therefore saying that we have a crisis mm. in our hand, mm. and that's what makes it a monster. Mm. Uh, excessive use mm. leads to damage to the organs mm. and death. Mm. Okay, we'll talk about excessive use and, and how this applies to different strata of society. How do people even come to it? And I'm talking about drug abuse. So, uh, the, the, the Nigeria's drug abuse problem has a history. Um, how did it all start? You know, can you take me back right. to history? So, thank you, Doc. Um, Nigeria wasn't known as a center. Mm. Even over the last 20 years, mm. Nigeria was transit, mm. but now Nigeria consume and transit. Mm. But the problem started in the 40s, sometime in the 40s, okay. after returning the men who went to fight in the Burma Wars. Mm. So there were mainly military men who went to fight the Burma Wars, and when they returned them in the 40s, mm. many had to start depending on cannabis and painkillers, okay. and they introduced and influenced other people. So that was when uh, this really started. Mm. Because I asked about that history because, you know, there are factors in there like increased availability of specific drugs, cultural shifts, or economic changes. 
uh, this must this all these factors may have you know all contributed right. to the rise isn't okay it? so if we say sometime in the 40s mm. the Britannies from Burma and so on but the real transits mm. and the types of drugs so uh, Nigeria mainly used what we call the opioids mm. the downers mm -hmm. like morphine mm. heroin and some codeine and then we progress to stimulants, oh. drugs that make you feel good. So the opioids like heroin, morphine, are downers. Mm. They don't give you energy. They make you feel cool. Mm. You look charming and calm. Okay. You know, you just, you, you just don't talk. Mm. Then you have the stimulants, cocaine. Mm. Amphetamine P. Those mm. ones are boosters. Mm. You go to meeting as a CEO. Mm. You use it to speak anyhow to anybody and you mm. command them. Mm. You you know you, you you are confident and bold. So could that uh, be recommended for a presidential debate? Well, people people do take it. You can't <laughs> recommend it because you can't recommend mm. criminality. Okay. But um, that you can't recommend it doesn't mean people don't do self prescription mm. because People get to become drug abusers mm. either through doctors recommending mm. or self-recommendation mm. or influences. So we went to the stimulants and then we started now producing in Nigeria methamphetamine, which is now taking and killing people. Mm. And then even Indian hemp, mm. which is another group, cannabis, uh, you now have synthetic ones, which I'm sure you've been hearing Canadian loud. Wow. And so cannabis is no longer fashionable mm. where you now have. So we, we, we now have the spectrum and the most painful thing, like over the counter drug codeine, mm. which used to be normal. Mm. Uh, young people and especially ladies are boozing it now. These days we know how tough things are in Nigeria. Um, and increasingly people blame poverty, you know. For the use of drugs is is it really the cause of contributing factor so beautiful what are the causes or what exposes people so first and foremost um environment mm. what they grow is what they will use that's number one number two some use it that i only use it to walk like gardeners they have their snuffs some use it to say they, it lets them uh, understand mathematics mm. and so they study and then sleep off mm. and then some also take alcohol mm. that is good as an aphrodisiac to mm. ha perform well mm. and when you booze it is a depressant they just sleep off mm. some are lucky they stay awake but what i'm just trying to say is that alcohol is something people use for recreation. Mm -hmm. However, excessive alcohol mm. is injurious. That's to them. Where the word so, abuse so comes what I'm, Yes, the abuse, excessive use. This is the discourse with Dr. Ken. Can you explain to me the impacts of drug abuse on communities? Because I know that it has okay. physical so, problems, social problems, mental problems, economic problems, financial problems, legal problems, and national problems. You can have physical dependence, like let's say someone is addicted on cocaine or heroin. Mm. Without it, they can't, they show with drain. Mm. That's physical. Mental mm -hmm. is you now start seeing people demonstrating. They become um, depressed and committing suicide mm. so that's mental issue they start hearing voices mm. then you have social people cannot keep marriages again mm. imagine somebody who is constantly on on a heroin and he needs money to so maintain it he might attack the spouse mm. so that's physical mental social mm. then you now start having financial mm. you see people um, they can't meet obligations again. They can't pay children's school fees. Mm. And then, of course, injuries. There is now more injuries and accidents. Mm. Imagine taking in Muri. <laughs> Sorry, I'm yes. sure some of you are not Igbo speakers. Yes. You also have the legal aspects. People drive and kill mm. and they are jailed for life. Mm. So what's the impact? Imagine mm. more medical care due to depression, and so on and so forth the healthcare system damaged organs so it means there will be pressure on the health systems mm. um 
under productivity, it means that the people, especially the youth and the aged ones, can't be in the labor market. And so you see that is a huge economic impact, social impact, and you need more caregivers mm. to help the addicts and to keep the rehabilitation center. This is The Discourse with Dr. Ken. Nigeria's harsh drug penalties often lead to uh, what I call recidivism. What do I mean by that? Should we prioritize stricter sentences to deter drug abuse or invest more in rehabilitation programs that offer chances of recovery for addicts? Um, it, it's really tricky. Mm -hmm. And why do I say tricky? You know, um, before, if they saw you with alcohol, mm. like Ogogoro, it was called the lizard gene, it was criminal. Mm. So people then moved it. Then at the time, Indian hemp was criminal. Now look at countries like Netherlands, Canada, that have legalized it of sorts. People are no longer killing themselves and looking at the... the I think that the case of those who take drug in Nigeria, some people actually have mental challenge. Government is trying. Okay. NDLA deserves award. Okay. Unless somebody doesn't know of NDLA, mm. they they if you just go on online, they even have a program that they do. Mm. But what I'm saying is, is not about advocacy alone is also about alternative and it's also about means of livelihood mm. uh, you, you know so but advocacy is there but mm. government can do more a lot more a lot more a, a prescription drug abuse is growing concern because of doctors especially in nigeria he's saying are doctors over prescribing pain medication inadvertently creating a new generation of addicts trapped in legal but dangerous cycle um I, I want to believe it's a yes and it's a no. It's a yes because nowadays um, people don't have all the time in the world mm. to make diagnosis. You know, sometimes uh, you need to to treat people over sessions and to understand for example uh, people may have symptoms and don't get at it mm. and you need to investigate patients okay. to get to the solution and the patients cannot pay for the investigations mm. let's cut it short somebody has a low back pain mm. and you have to do ct scan and mri okay. this will cost about hundred and twenty thousand naira mm. and so you say this is your low back pain i would like to investigate it for one twenty thousand and i'm sure we'll get to the bottom of the pain mm. and the person says you know what mm. if it's one thousand one twenty thousand i know what to do mm. uh, doctor just write something for me now mm. i'll come back the man writes take paracetamol or take indoseed mm. or whatever mm. This person just goes and he doesn't return again. So, so, and, and so is the patient leading a doctor in that instance? Or so, doctor well, the doctor the must always respect the patient. He says you need to do this low back pain needs CT scan mm. and MRI to know the level mm. before I will be able to address your pain. He says, well, you know, I don't have the 120, but for now, what can I take? Mm. And he prescribes... Um, a painkiller, analgesics. This person never stops taking it again. And so um, it, it's a tricky one. The doctor prescribed, but he says take it when you feel the pain. And the guy just says there is no date limit. And he goes, so, so yes, there is the role of the doctor when he says take it whenever you feel the pain. Mm -hmm. And then the person just says, well, maybe I don't have to go. But again, the patient has a right. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't have money, he doesn't go back. And so it's, 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 it's an evil... Um, circle mm. where uh, this so these are some of the things where doctors are now 
prescribing mm. and people don't follow up because they also can't afford mm. and some can afford and they just don't believe in it mm. and and so yes uh, th these are some of the channels yeah so you don't blame the doctors as well oh no no, no um, <laughs> um I, I i can't blame the doctors but i can where a doctor mm. is negligent in doing the duty mm. to say this is just for three days mm. not that just take it whenever you so so if you are negligent in prescription then mm. the doctor is culpable yeah so now we know where the blame will be um, there's always a balance to that to that anyway and in terms of conversation between doctor and patient so yeah. there's a question from Ozioma uh, Wanko but by the way I think I know Ozioma Wanko very brilliant lady um, and she's going back to codeine cough syrup and and her question is ban or regulate she's saying abuse of codeine cough syrup is a major issue should the government implement a complete ban risking a black market surge or a stricter regulation in public awareness campaigns or a more effective long-term solution you see the truth is mm. codeine is not a dangerous drug okay Codeine is a prescription drug, mm. just like Valium is a prescription drug. Mm. But people realize their side effects mm. is desirable. Okay. Like I said, Valium is to relax muscle, mm. side effect is sleep. Mm. And grandmothers and all these old people started taking it. Mm. Codeine mm. is to an antitusive mm. to prevent cough. And so you see Benilin with codeine, that's... A, either expectorant mm. or preventing cough. Mm. But codeine is also a downer. If it's a prescription drug, you shouldn't ban it because it has its benefits. Otherwise, some people are going to cough their lungs out. But how do you prevent those who want to abuse it? So it should be in education and enforcement and also the pharmacists have a role but the pharmacist also knows it's meant to be an over-the-counter drug mm. but just imagine if any of us now go give me 10 bottles the, the pharmacist shouldn't sell mm. but I again is a tricky one but the truth is there is no justification to ban what mm. is not um, mm. a, a, a detrimental drug to but mm. I think is the control and that's where NAVDA comes in and others because mm. they are meant to be for drug administration and control, and control but yeah. it's the control mm. uh, regulation and enforcement and there's a lot of campaign mm. but when you see somebody importing two containers of codeine mm. shouldn't you confiscate and destroy it mm. if there is no need for such demand I think it should be confiscated and destroyed mm. You, you know, why would you buy such quantity if there is no demand? Everything should be evidence But Nigeria is a large country, so two, 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 even 10 containers of cotton is, is, is uh, insignificant. But there must be justification the yeah. for the importer and the distribution network. Yeah, but it's a cough syrup. You are right. Again, it's so you, you can see, you can also <laughs> challenge me and I say, yeah. well, it's a, it's a cough syrup, so, mm. so uh, uh, it's an antitusive, so, mm. so should I start coughing and killing myself? Mm. So it's, it's a tricky one. But by the way, pediatricians wouldn't even usually use uh, expectorants, which people also prescribe, because how many tiny child, age zero to five, do you see actually coughing out and spitting out, you know? So, mm. so it's, it's all, mm. perhaps some of these drugs should never mm. have existed. Mm. We, we, we medicine advanced beyond them, but, mm. but not the codeine one. The codeine one had a, a reason, mm. but it was just people are now using it for the side effects. This is The Discourse with Dr. Ken. One in four women, mm. and the rate of women going into this age is 15. So it means that a cancer mm. is eating us. Mm. Okay, it's actually a cancer. Now let's let's go to traditional medicine. You know, um, because oh, it's a society yeah. we live well, in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a good one. It's a society we can't just stay on the upper echelon. You know, which I always call upstream. But let's look at history because it's a society we live. People say Nigeria is a developing country. It's not. It's underdeveloped. Um, so traditional medicine, and for me, it is, the question here is balancing culture and control. Um, what, am, what am I trying to say? Some traditional medicines have pro, uh, psychoactive properties. Should these be categorized as drugs and regulated potentially 
or if we do that, will it potentially hinder our cultural practices? Well, um, in, interesting for me, I, I did uh, botany okay. before doing medicine. Oh, okay. So in botany, you have a specialized field called uh, pharmacognosy. Okay. And pharmacognosy is compounding of drugs from herbs. Mm. So all these uh, drugs we take, some are natural, um, like cannabis, and some are compounded or synthetic. So in traditional medicine, um, they use a lot of natural herbs and they've been trying to regulate it now. So NAVDAC also regulates it. Just in case people don't know, you can get your registration from NAVDAC. However, um, because you mentioned traditional medicine, whilst I was um, passing through as a professional uh, training, Mm. many years ago in um, neuropsychiatric hospital mm. Abel Kuta. Okay. Uh, the team of doctors and professionals had a traditional native doctor, so native doctor we understand, mm. who was the first person I ever saw on alcohol addiction. Mm. We normally see uh, other drugs but not alcohol. So we asked this traditional doctor, native doctor that, mm. Mr. Man, when you successfully leave the rehabilitation center mm. and you compound this your roots and mm. put alcohol who will be testing it for you you know mm. he got boost mm. he, whenever he compounds the thing mm. he drinks a bottle and compounds half a bottle mm. so now that you see <laughs> so, so i mean that's just because that but, but what i'm just trying to say is mm. that um Traditional medicine mm. have very potent. Um, all this uh, lignocaine and all these uh, things, mm. they, they also know them. Antidepressants, they also know them. They mm. know, mm. but now NAVDAC has given the opportunity mm. for them to register these things, and the harmful ones and not harmful ones are being codified. Oh, that's great. Uh, Dr. Shiem is faith based solutions because I'm talking solutions now. Um, the role of religion in recovery because you know people are in it it is what it is we've seen how far you know how deep this whole menace has gone but in terms of uh, recovery now the role of religion in recovery religious leaders often condemn drug abuse and drug use that we salute them for so the question i ask is that can they play a more active role in prevention and rehabilitation of this effort the ecosystem doesn't leave anybody out there. Oh, no, I don't touch alcohol. No, I don't touch this. You see so many bankers that I've got to meet up. Oh. So, so please, all these drugs too are things NAVDAC has actually written against them, tries to say so, but there is so much money pushing their So that by side. Mm. You see, one of the biggest curer mm. and the biggest guide is the brain okay. and the mind. Okay. Faith healing and abroad they call them different names um but if you can walk on somebody's mind and faith and if somebody says to you i believe i will be healed and in christianity you see christ told the blind man and other people so they have a strong role however you cannot just say Avoid all the other forms of support treatment, like counseling, uh, like uh, medical support, and just rely. But I'm saying those who are faith healers and traditional healers really do a lot. Mm. They minister to the mind. Mm. They minister to the soul. They also show love. Mm. And so they are a very strong um, part of the team wow. you, to to rehabilitate people is not the forty of doctors alone. Uh -huh. is 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 a big um, um, uh, team that uh, can do the the rehabilitation. We have this be beautiful. I mean, when I mean beautiful, is a trend. Not just not because our uh, tertiary institutions are of no good. I don't believe in that because I still think that our top tertiary institutions, the Unilax of this world, the University of Ibadan, the UNN, the IFES of this world, the Madubele University. I, I still think they are top rate universities, depending from where you see it. But what is in vogue today is to use that last penny you have saved to send your child abroad um, 
to Canada, to the UK, to America, in fact, to places like Cyprus, Ukraine. So it's just a trend now. It's, it's like wearing a designer belt, isn't it? But there's some consequence that comes from to, with it, especially if, we, if in the context of drug exposure and drug abuse. Um, our senior brother on radio will call it bounding people to the Philistines. You know, these people are very young, 15, 16, 17, and they are dead overseas. Their parents are not there far flung Eastern Europe and Western Europe. So uh, these guys are really, really in danger. As if drug abuse is as serious as what you have described this afternoon, what is your take on well, this? Well, I, I, I think um, I will give you a personal award, and my award is that God bless you. There mm. is no bigger award. Mm. You see, many parents will be happy with you. I'm particularly happy with you as a parent. Mm. My brother, the environment I live, mm. I know people who've sent our children abroad and they are drug addicts today. Mm. Why is that? These children were raised by us. Mm. They had everything. They got abroad. They see you're on your own. Yeah. Nobody helps you. It's a tough You've got It's tough. It's tough yeah. It is not a, a community mm. arrangement. Mm. It's a nuclear very, very yeah. micro nuclear, and so personal, these you know, children it's, it's, it's a tough place. just get there. Nobody yeah. wants to help them. No, auntie, then no they brother. go online. Yeah, boy, yeah. Then they go online. Just type. Cope. How do you cope with life and feel good? Yeah. You just see different kind of drugs. Yeah. Sadly, they can also compound it. So, if you've not turned your children to born again or Muslim yeah. or uh, uh, moral. Yeah. Once they go there, they just type how to cope with life. They just see different kind of drugs. And now, what are the kind of drugs? Access, vapes, they put some things. Your friends even gives you. Yeah. So let's go out. So they get into these drugs. And you know the sad thing, Dr. Ken? Mm -hmm. Even when your parent knows you are not keeping up in school, the hospital and the doctor is not obliged mm -hmm. to disclose what is wrong with your child. Mm -hmm. Remember, they are in uni, mm -hmm. they are over 18. Mm -hmm. So even when you think something is wrong and you see your child, if he refuses to tell you anything, you can't help. You are now seeing people between the ages of 18 to 22 mm -hmm. shuffling like Parkinson because mm -hmm. they've destroyed. So all I'm saying is I thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You didn't forget the youth. Mm -hmm. They have access. Mm -hmm. They can design. They can clean up. They, in fact, they can mask you getting them to say they are alone. Mm -hmm. So I want to say because I have children and I love Parents should be using everything, moral, Christian, Islam, traditional, just showing those children love. If you are tired, just call me. Because where they are, they have Miranda. You do not have to open your mouth to talk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my take, my take with it is that people could say yes, it's because you can afford it. But listen, things are really tough. And in terms of priority, I still. I'm and saying if you can't afford to send those children yeah, there, it's, it's, don't send the children there. Yeah, any young person here yeah, should take a first degree in Nigeria. I think so. I, I, I would. I will, I, it's only that we cannot say what a, is unconstitutional anyway. here yeah, yeah. because it's just against advice, you know. freedom of right. But yeah. with your advice, yeah. I agree yeah. that it, 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 it's it, it's just yeah. impossible to sustain yeah, it. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Now, Dr. Shem, you are a known consultant and expert in performance stress management but performance related to, uh, to touches me what what exactly do you mean when you talk about performance is it above the line or below the line all right so um performance means effect uh, uh, effectiveness and efficiency okay. so my phd was um in management apart from the medical degree mm -hmm. and it was on the impact of values based leadership yeah and corporate governance on organizational performance. Okay. So I'm talking of organizational performance. performance. Okay. Not, not, it has nothing to do with relationships. Well, organizational... it's expert in relationship management. Yeah, well, well, you can't talk of performance mm. and not looking at the ecosystem. You're talking okay. of human being. Mm. So looking at right from how much of an EI do they have, mm. how what much of EI? emotional intelligence, okay. how much of goals mm -hmm. from high level, mm -hmm. you know, how much of... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, mm -hmm. uh, if people are in 
an organization mm. where most of them are addicts, mm. you will end up shutting down from injuries, mm. accidents, non-compliance. Mm. So yes, so that's the, but it's, it's purely a management um, yeah, yeah. performance. Fantastic. Above the line. Yes. Above. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shea. <laughs> Always a pleasure. It's a fantastic topic we've had today. It's one of those that we will consider part two because we couldn't possibly exhaust all the pertinent questions that will come that came out from the, the, the space. Um, it's actually a menace. It's a big monster. Um, but it's something society live with. You can only manage it as much as you can. You have your, as usual, Dr. Shea, your proverb for the week and then your song for the week. Okay. My proverb is in Yoruba, but I'll translate it to English. Oh. Is T O Batori Ishu Jepo Watori Eko Jeshu. In other words, if you don't chop, if you don't eat yam because of palm oil, you because of palm oil eat yam. Okay. You know, if you don't eat yam mm. because of palm oil, mm. when you see palm oil, mm. you demand for yam. For yam. You know. So that is there. Mm. And uh, my music, I'm not King Cole Nature Boy. Meanwhile, have a fantastic week ahead of you. Bye. And that's it on the discourse with Dr. Ken.